Hello and welcome to the programme where you really might be able to do something to help stop crime. The detectives behind me are investigating the cases we're covering tonight. There are BBC researchers if you prefer to speak to them. And of course, your call will, if you wish, be completely confidential. Almost 2,000 viewers rang in after last month's programme. 70 of those calls were about the murder of Diane Sendall, a florist from Seacombe on the Wirral. On the 1st of August, Diane's van ran out of petrol in the centre of Birkenhead and her body was found nearby next morning. On Tuesday, a 29-year-old man from Birkenhead was remanded in custody, charged with Diane's murder. And 250 people called us about this picture. It's thought to be the face of the man who killed Alison Day in East London, Marty Tamboza, a Dutch schoolgirl, and Anne Locke, a television secretary. Detectives say they were delighted that so many viewers tried to help. They've eliminated about 50 leads on who the impression might be, but there are many more to go yet. You may recall last month's reconstruction of the murder of Che Keng Hong, a Chinese restaurateur. He was murdered in his home in Holloway, and luncheon vouchers like these were among things that were stolen. Well, a viewer called and led police to where he'd seen a pile of vouchers on the night of the murder outside Drayton Park Station in London. It was a Monday night in August and only half a mile from the murder scene. Now, if you were at Drayton Park Station or using these phone boxes, the night was Monday, August the 11th, especially if you saw the vouchers. Please do call us. Don't worry if you picked the vouchers up and took them home. The police aren't remotely interested in that. They want to catch a murderer. So here's the number. If there's any way that you think you can help, please call 01 811-8055. And also last month, we asked for your help to solve a series of burglaries at museums across Yorkshire and the Midlands. Police needed to trace the valuable silver stolen from there and from this house in Downham Market in Norfolk, where the owner has now been robbed twice. We had possible sightings of the silver in markets all over the country and even one person who thinks they saw a missing chain in San Francisco. Those are all being checked out and of course we will report back. And one year on, a result from Crime Watch last October. This man robbing building societies in North London turned out to be a 31-year-old decorator from Finsbury Park. He was recognised by a viewer and within 24 hours of the programme he'd been arrested and charged with seven robberies and a burglary. He's now begun a jail sentence of six years. Incidentally, people always wonder what the difference is between robbery and burglary. A burglary simply means trespassing or breaking into premises to commit an offence, like stealing, and robbery is actually stealing from somebody while threatening them or using force. So now you know. Now to the first of this month's reconstructions. It's a crime that's been in the news again tonight. It was a week ago that Karen Hadaway and Nicola Fellows went missing. At about this time, search parties were setting out to look for them. Sussex police have helped us with the family's consent to reconstruct what's known so far. It may be that their killer was a local man, perhaps he even knew the girls, but he could have come from anywhere at all. What's not in doubt is that last Thursday he was in Brighton. The Moolscombe estate lies across the A27 Brighton to Lewis Road, just opposite is Wild Park. This is where last Friday afternoon two local teenagers had come to search the undergrowth in response to police appeals for help. And this is where they found the bodies of the two girls in a play den deep inside the undergrowth. Right, good morning ladies and gentlemen. The information from the public continues to flow in. It's now day five of the inquiry. Of we increased the team again today. We seem to be increasing it almost daily now. This is the largest investigation in Sussex since the Brighton bombing. Already 10,000 people have been interviewed and 4,000 homes have been visited. There were a number of new sightings of the two girls up until about 6.30 p.m. Unfortunately, we still have not got a sighting of these girls going into that park. Newick Road, East Moolscombe. At five last Thursday afternoon, the girls were playing with a group of friends outside a neighbour's house. Soon after, they made their way from Newick Road here across the A27 to Wild Park. A park policeman clearly remembers seeing them, even though the girls were forbidden to come here by their parents. 5.15 last Thursday, I was walking through the park. I saw two girls under the tree 
swinging on the tree. I approached him and told him asked him what they was getting what they was doing up there. Now come on, what are you doing up there? It's all going to hurt yourself. That was 5.15, and this is the last precise timing police have. Sometime in the next half hour, the girls crossed back over the main A27. At roughly quarter to six, they were outside the fish and chip shop in Barkham Road. Next, they were seen going down the subway that leads back to the Wild Park side of the road. It was now six to 6.15. Anyway, you're going to the Wild Park. From the subway, they must have headed up Coldean Lane towards another fish and chip shop. This girl, 16-year-old Tracy Cox, is the next witness. She noticed the girls, whom she knew, outside the shop, and as she left, she spoke to them. Tracy then walked with them back over the main road and into the estate. Police are anxious to establish precise timings. The three girls passed the playground near Barkham Place. Could you have seen them there? Nicola, with the dark hair, was wearing a very bright pink sweatshirt. Isn't it about time you two are going home now? Yeah, we yeah. are. Tracy says she left them near the end of Ringma Road, not far from where they lived. Tracy! Bye! By now, it was getting dark, and both girls' parents had been looking for them. This girl, Michelle Tippett, was coming down Barkham Road after delivering papers on the estate. Where are we going? Oh, we're going to Wild Park. Oh, you better tell your mum first. No. Michelle met them at roughly 6.25. Come on, Karen. One minute. Karen, come on. Right. I'll see you later. Bye. After that, they crossed the road again and at about 6.30, they were seen outside the entrance to the park. My Karen wouldn't go off with any strangers. Had to be somebody that the Nicola and Karen both knew, both trusted, and it's very important for everybody, not just necessarily people on this estate, but on all the estates in Brighton, if you know something, no matter how small it seems to you, to the police, it's very important. Just get in touch with them. Ring them anonymously, you know, if you must do. Anything, don't matter how small, please, just get in touch with them. Because it could save the life of somebody else's child. John McConnell, there can't be many more distressing crimes you've had to investigate. No, this was a particularly horrific offence of murder, committed against two, two children of tender years and both were indecently assaulted just prior to their death. I'm therefore appealing to anybody that saw these two girls in the Wild Park or Mosk and Coombe area after 5 p.m. on Thursday last, the 9th of October. I'm also appealing for anybody who was in the Wild Park area or Mosk Coombe area of Brighton during that period and who have not yet come and seen us and told us what they were doing. Now, you announced today that two young men were seen running away from that park. That was about 7 o'clock, 7.30 that evening? Yes, there were two youths seen by two separate people coming away from the Wild Park area at approximately 7.30 p.m. last Thursday, the 9th of October, and we're very anxious to up get them to come forward so that they can be eliminated from the inquiry. Now, they might be completely innocent, of course, just running away, larking around, they might have been late for something, and they might be a little reluctant after all this publicity to come forward, thinking, oh, we're going to be in for some pretty tough questioning. Yes, that's quite true, but it's essential that they do come forward so that we can eliminate them and then get on with looking at other people who might be more significant in the inquiry. Obviously, it's going to waste hundreds of man-hours if they don't come forward voluntarily as well. Yes, we've had a very t big team of officers on this inquiry, and, of course, we're anxious to uh, use their resources in the best way possible. Now, there was an appeal some time ago about a man who'd been cruising in, I think it was a blue car, a couple of weeks before this incident, and it was thought that he might have been trying to solicit small girls. Yes, that's true. 
Um, we've been trying to establish the identity of a man who, approximately three weeks ago, tried to uh, inveigle a young girl into his car, which was a blue car, and as yet we haven't traced this man. He was said to be approximately 25 years of age. He had ginger hair, and of course we are again very anxious to trace him, so that again perhaps he can be eliminated from the inquiry also. Well, please remember, if you can help in any way, it might be that someone's moved in to you near where you live who uh, you think might have been in Brighton at the time. It might have been somebody local about whom you have suspicions. It doesn't matter where you live. If you can call us, you might prevent what happened to Karen and Nicola from happening again. The number here in the studio, here it is, 01811 8055, 01811 8055. Or you can call the incident room in Brighton directly, 0273 606 744. That's 0273 606 744. Well, now the incident desk. This month we have news from one of last month's appeals, the body in Ashdown Forest, and new appeals from Staffordshire on literally hundreds of thefts of porcelain, and from Darlington, a hit-and-run accident which killed a young man. Here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. First, two significant developments in the inquiry to identify the body of a woman found in the Ashdown Forest in August. Last month, we showed you these curtains which were wrapped around the dismembered remains. We now know that these floral patterned ones are among just 250 which were sold through a mail order catalogue from Empire Stores in Bradford. They were on sale in 1982, and we'd now like to know who bought them. The second curtain, this blue acrylic one, was recognised by a Crime Watch viewer. She actually remembered the stitching she'd done herself on the hem. She sold them a year ago at a car boot sale somewhere near East Grinstead to a small woman in her 30s. Now that woman might be the murder victim, so we desperately need to know where the curtains have been since. It's quite possible that the woman was never reported missing, so please think, particularly in the southeast and since the end of August, do you know of anyone who's gone missing and fits this description? She's white. Five foot three, medium build, and she was probably a mother, aged between 20 and 40. Next, a fatal hit and run in Darlington. Gary Britton, aged 19, was found dead in Brinkburn Road in the early hours of Saturday, 13th of September. Gary had spent the previous evening at Rumours Nightclub. He left the club at 2 a.m. and was driven by friends to Major Street. They dropped him off and then left him walking up towards Brinkburn Road. The time was about 2.15 a.m. Fifteen minutes later, Gary was found dead in Brinkburn Road, near the junction with Major Street. He had suffered severe head injuries. Forensic evidence shows that he was killed by a car or van, which was probably dark red or maroon, and that whilst he was hit, he was already lying in the road. How he came to be there is still a mystery. Now, there are several people who can help. A woman has already rung police and said that she actually saw Gary Britton being run over. We'd like that woman to ring us now, in confidence. And we'd like to hear from a young woman in her late teens or early twenties who was seen running along Willow Road, which runs parallel with Brinkburn Road at about the time of Gary's death. And finally, of course, anyone who was in Brinkburn Road between 2.15 and 2.30 a.m. on Saturday the 13th of September, you may be able to help us identify the driver of the car or van which killed Gary Britton. There was an unusual robbery in Leicester on the 21st of July. That morning, a van was delivering cash to the Bewcastle Grove sub-post office. At the same time, two men were waiting nearby. One was in a wheelchair, and he suddenly produced a sawn-off shotgun from under his blanket and jumped up to attack the post office escorts. As the robbery happened, the second man threatened onlookers with a handgun, and within minutes, those two and a third and a driver made off in a grey Cortina estate. Two clues here. The wheelchair, which was abandoned after the robbery. It's an Excelsior make, it folds up, and it's blue with a canvas back and cream plastic handles. As you can see, a section of the back has been cut out, but there's still some lettering partly visible. If you own this or used it in a hospital or nursing home, give us a call. And secondly, the Cortina estate. It was bought under a false name at a London auction. When it was sold, it was beige, but since then it's been hand-painted all over with grey primer. 
We'd be very interested to hear about anyone who had a Cortina, which they hand-painted grey, around the end of June, beginning of July. A team of burglars have struck in Cheshire and Staffordshire at a rate of one theft every day since the beginning of 1985, a total of over 600 burglaries. They've so far got away with over £200,000 worth of Royal Dalton figurines. The gang pick on houses where the figures can be seen from outside. These are typical of the ones that have been stolen. This is Jack Point, the court jester, a rare piece worth £650. And this is one of the more common pieces, Winston Churchill, worth just £50. We particularly want to hear from antique dealers or specialised Royal Dalton dealers who have been offered such objects over the last 18 months. And if you own a Royal Dalton, don't display it in the window. Put a distinguishing mark on it. And if you are getting it valued, only go to a registered dealer. Finally, take a look at these antique matchboxes. They're practically all that's left of a lifetime collection which was stolen from an elderly lady in Lancashire. She's in her late 70s and lives with her older sister. On Friday the 11th of July, the first time they'd been out for months, thieves smashed down their front door and took over 300 Vesta matchboxes. They date from 1875 to 1926, and the designs range from animals and shells to musical instruments. And early advertising logos, like this one for Bass Pale Ale. The brass elephant's head with ivory tusks is identical to about 20 which were stolen. And this is an early advertisement for the Canadian Pacific Shipping Company. It took a range of these bearing the names of different shipping companies. In all, about £3,000 worth were stolen, but their owner who travelled the country building up her collection, they're priceless. So if you've seen them, or if you can help with any of tonight's cases, please ring us. Here's the number, 01811 That's 01811 it's now nearly 12 weeks since Susie Lamplew left her estate agent's office to meet a client and never returned. Perhaps the unusual nature of the crime, perhaps the fact that 25-year-old Susie was such an attractive, outgoing girl, kept the press constantly interested in her case. In fact, the stories about what happened to Susie are so many and varied that the facts have become somewhat obscured by rumour and gossip. The reconstruction you're about to see is based entirely on what is known, on police evidence and eyewitness reports. It begins in Putney, southwest London, on the morning of the day Susie disappeared. Monday the 28th of July. Susanna was getting up in her flat in Disraeli Road in Putney. Private Secretary has rejected claims by the Sunday Times that there have been differences between the Palace and the Prime Minister over Mrs. Thatcher's policies. In a letter to this morning's Times, he says the Queen's Press Secretary, Michael Shea, did speak to the... Sunday Susie Times shared her flat with a lodger, Nick Bryant. Hi, Susie, I'm off. Oh, hi, you're up, Annie. Would you like a tea for you? I can't. I've got to make 30 meetings this morning. Are you going to be in tonight? Yeah, I expect so. I'll see you later. Oh, by the way, have you left the ironing board up? Yes, it's in the city. Great. Okay, okay. See you tonight. Bye. 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 Just after 8.30, Susie set off for work in her company car. It was only a 10-minute drive from home to her office in the Fulham Road. Hello, this is Susanna Lampley from Sturgis in Fulham. Did you receive our details that we sent through to you? Oh, good. Did you see anything? Susanna had worked for Sturgis estate agents as a negotiator for just over a year. Her job involved taking on new clients and showing them round properties. Sometimes she'd have as many as six houses to show in a day. On this Monday, she left the office at 20 to 1, and as was often the case, she told no one where she was going or when she'd be back. As well as her own keys and purse, she took with her property details and keys for a house in Shorolds Road, number 37. Exactly what happened after Susie left her office isn't clear. There's no doubt she went to Shorolds Road. But in fact, there are three streets in Fulham which provide vital sightings. 
In Sherrill's Road, three witnesses saw Susanna outside number 37. The first witness was on his way home. He saw Susie standing in the gateway. She seemed to be waiting for someone. Ten minutes after that, the owner of the house next door heard someone leaving number 37. That brief glimpse led to this artist's impression. At about the same time, Nicholas Doyle was on his way to the nearby North End Road market. Doyle remembers the man was carrying a bottle of champagne with ribbons on it. From his description, police later produced this identikit picture of the man. But strangely, Susie's car was never seen in Charles Road. A number of people did see it a mile away in Stevenage Road. It's a five minute drive from Sturgis and it was exactly five minutes after she'd left the office that the first sighting came. At 12.45, as Wendy Jones was leaving home to go shopping, she noticed the white Ford Fiesta parked immediately opposite her house. Just before two, a taxi driver who lived close by also noticed the car. By 3.30, Wendy Jones was back and the car was still in exactly the same place, slightly overlapping the entrance to a neighbour's garage. Then at a quarter past five, the garage owner, Richard Mann, saw it too. Other witnesses remember the car in the same position. It seems it was there all afternoon. But in a third street in Fulham, there's conflicting evidence. A sighting of Susie and her car. The Fulham Palace Road is about half a mile from Stevenage Road. At about 2.45, Barbara Whitfield, a friend of Susanna's, was cycling to a business appointment she has no doubt she saw Susie driving towards her. She waved, but Susie was talking to her passenger and didn't see her. I'm sure it was Susie, because I knew her very well. Um, at the time, I was convinced it was her car as well, although it conceivably could be one that was just similar, they're quite common. I didn't get a chance to look at him, because she was turned towards him. Um, and anyway, I, wasn't, I was concentrating on her rather than him. By 3.30 that afternoon, Sturgis manager Mark Gurdon and his staff were becoming concerned by Susanna's absence. In her desk diary, they noticed an appointment for 12.45. To start off with, I personally went round to 37 Sherrolds Road to see if she perhaps got herself locked in or something like that. After there was no joy there, we phoned round between us, loaded the local hospitals to see if she'd been involved in an accident with her car or anything like that. We continued to do that actually for a few hours because obviously she could have gone to Putney or where she lived, so we checked with those hospitals. Um, finally, before actually officially reporting her missing to the police, we phoned her mother just to check to see if she'd gone home. She hadn't gone there. And obviously by that stage we were very concerned and phoned it about 5.30 to the police to report her officially missing. Be on the lookout for a white Ford Fiesta, registration mark B Bravo 396 G Golf A Alpha, end of ember. It's concerned that abduction from... At 9 o'clock, police began a street search for Susie's car. It was still parked in the same place in Stevenage Road. Full on receiving. I found this white Ford Fiesta, B Bravo 396, Golf Alpha November in Stevenage Road. Can you inform the CID, please? The driver's door was unlocked and inside was her purse, but neither her own keys nor the keys to 37 Sherrolds Road have yet been found. The driving seat was pushed back from Susie's normal driving position. 
This picture was taken on Saturday night, just two days before she disappeared. Susie Lamplew has now been missing for 81 days. Well, Detective Superintendent Carter, one of the strangest things is that, as we can see from the map, she parked her car in Stevenage Road, and yet she was going to an appointment in Charles Road. Why do you think that was? That is right. It takes uh, exactly five minutes from where she parked her car on Stevenage Road to Sherrill's Road. And we know that she arrived there, or the car was definitely seen at 12.45. What about the sighting of her, the third sighting, at about 2.45, by a friend of hers in the Fulham Palace Road? How do you account for that? Well, Miss Whitford is the only witness throughout this inquiry who actually knows. So, of course, her sighting has to be taken very seriously. Mm, it's a complete mystery. It was the last time she was seen alive, too. That is the last time, yes. What about the keys to 37 Shorrells Road and the property details? They've never been found, have they? No, when she le left the company, she took keys to the property of number 37 on this distinctive yellow fob. We still haven't found that. So perhaps somebody might have seen that. Um, could we have your description again of the man that Mr Doyle saw? I gather you're much happier with the description you got from him than perhaps the one that got more publicity of Mr Kipper earlier on. Yes, we're, we're looking for a type. I'm asking that people look for a type. He's aged 25 to 30. He has a dark complexion and we believe probably a broken nose. He has dark hair which is swept back and he was immaculately dressed in a charcoal dark suit. Do you think Susie knew him? Well, the fact that the car was at Stevenage and, Sher and Sherald's, she was seen later, indicates that she probably did know him, yes. Now, the other important thing is that a couple were seen arguing fiercely in that area, weren't they, by a man who hailed a cab, a taxi cab, later on? Yes, between 2 and 2.30, a taxi was held by a man who has a full beard and moustache. And he told the taxi driver he'd just witnessed a couple having an argument. Now, I'm appealing to that man to come forward, and of course I would like to eliminate the couple who, in fact, were having the argument. Mm, he might have vital information, mightn't he? He could well have vital information, yes. Now, this case has had so much publicity, as I said earlier on. A lot of people have come forward to help. There's been a lot of rumour and gossip, really. What do you think that tonight's reconstruction might achieve that all this publicity hasn't so far? Well, it's nearly 12 weeks since, since Susie disappeared. Now, I'm absolutely convinced that someone somewhere out there knows and can help us and I do earnestly appeal for that person to come forward. We just need that one call Mr Carter thank you very much. Do please call us if you have anything that might help. It's 01 811 8055 here to the studio 01 811 8055 or you can call the inquiry headquarters and that is 01 741 6212 that's London 741 6212 and ask for the incident room. Now to television's answer to the wanted poster, Crime Watch Photo Call. All you have to do is watch some faces, see if there's anyone you recognise. Here with the details, David Hatcher and Helen Phelps. First on this month's photo call, Rifat Mehmet, a convicted criminal who until a week ago was serving an 18-year sentence for armed robbery and assault. He was brought up from Albany Prison on the Isle of Wight to attend a court hearing in London. After the hearing, a man with a gun threatened the three officers who were escorting Mehmet and ordered them to release him. During the escape, Mehmet tried to slash one of the warders with a Stanley knife blade, and then the two of them made off in a blue Ford Sierra. Rafat Mehmet is 29 and 5 foot 10. If you see him, don't approach him. He's a dangerous man. But if you know where he is, ring us. We want to interview Michael Portis. He worked on the south coast as a casino cashier, but he went sick on August the 12th and hasn't been seen since. The Sergeant York's casino in Brighton had £16,000 stolen and the Hove Sporting Club lost 24000 the same day. Portis is a professional gambler. He's 39, 5 foot 9 and of slim build. He has no known girlfriends and of course he may or may not still have the beard. Now to this man, Philip King, who we'd like to trace in connection with a murder inquiry. He's 19 and 5 foot 8, with a gold upper front tooth and a definite Cockney accent. A man was stabbed to death after leaving a party in North London last August. Seven men are due to stand trial next month, and we need to interview Philip King before then. He sometimes uses the name Mark King, and sometimes wears glasses. He's been seen in Manchester and Birmingham but it could also be in Bristol or the Walthamstow and Leighton area of London. 
Ring us if you've seen him or any of the faces on tonight's photo call. And the number again is 01811 Do bear with us if the lines are engaged. Please keep trying. 01811 Our next case carries a truly vast reward. It's an unorthodox raid on an exclusive jeweller's in one of the most fashionable streets in London. It happened on a Thursday morning, the last day of July. New Bond Street, looking towards Oxford Street from Sotheby's. Victor and Anne Tan's first floor showroom is just up from Sotheby's and the room next door to them has been empty for over a year. The Tan's showroom is protected by a sophisticated alarm and no jewels are kept out on display. Even if you work early nearby, it's unlikely you'd pay much attention to three men entering the building. Police think they may have arrived after the cleaners around seven in the morning. One of them made for a landing window at the back and put on gloves like these. The paint on this drain pipe is non-drying. He was now inside the empty room next to the Tan showrooms. The alarm in this room had been off for months. The robbers must have known there was now just a partition wall between them and the Tan's showrooms. This is an angle grinder with a carbon fiber blade. Any builder or hire shop has them. They could now scan the room without setting off the Tan's alarms. A carpenter's mitre block was glued on to hold the wall in place while they cut a doorway through the plaster. Ten o'clock and Victor Tan's secretary arrived at work. Turned off the alarms. Got the keys to the safe? No. If you handcuff me like that, I won't be able to work the phone or the door. Victor comes in about 11, doesn't he? Doesn't he? One hour to wait. To the secretary, the burglar seemed remarkably calm. She remembers one used the name George and another was called Henry. Get over, Henry. Clean that mess up. And one man offered her red dentine chewing gum. Don't shout her off. Blow your head off. Get the keys off him. Come on. I'm too nervous. 
nervous. You must be quiet. We won't take the watch. We're here to do a job. The jewels were tipped into a mailbag. Another mailbag was left behind. Gag him. Take off her to that. Victor Tan was gagged with a tie that one of the robbers had been wearing. We'll call the police in 15 minutes. This is the man in charge of the K Superintendent Hutchinson of the Central Robbery Squad. Did they, in fact, call the police afterwards? No, they didn't, Nick. Now, I gather you've been able to link this robbery with other robberies in the same area. Yes, there have been at least three similar robberies in the last two years in New Bond Street. All of them carry really big rewards, very, very big. Yes, substantial rewards. And I, I, I think it's true to say anybody who actually recovers the property and puts the perpetrators inside could pretty much retire for life on the reward proceeds. Yes, most certainly, if they uh, give us information leading to the arrest of the people and also the recovery of their property. Now, talking of property, you've brought a veritable black museum in with you. Can you explain what all these items are, are what you want to know about them? Yes, these are gloves, similar to the gloves worn by the robbers on the day in question. You can and, tell that uh, from the paint marks on the wall, could you? Uh, that is correct, yes. And also, they may have had a T on the back of the glove. That is a disc, similar to the disc that was used for cutting. That is the actual mitre block with the super glue on it that was used to push in the panel the dentine chewing gum that was used by the robber. This is the actual post office sack, a second sack that was taken, which was left at the scene. And uh, that's the Ultimo tie, which is exclusive to Ultimo and uh, was manufactured by them about three years ago and uh, was only for sale in their shop in German Street. Now, all those things are bits of the jigsaw, and you're just saying, if any viewer can put bits of them together... That is correct, ..please yes. call. What about the jewellery itself? Worth a fortune, very, very distinctive. Yes, there's a diamond butterfly brooch, a ruby and diamond ring, and a diamond triple clip brooch, and a sapphire and diamond bracelet. Now, these items of jewellery are 1930s Art Deco. Now, they were purchased from Sotheby's and are unique themselves. Uh, broken up, uh, they mean nothing, but to a jeweller, Obviously, they're very identifiable. And presumably, because they're so valuable, they wouldn't be broken up, which is most unlikely. That's correct. Right. The number to call, if you uh, can help, is 01811-8055, or you can call the Robbery Squad Direct on London 230-2061. That's 01-230-2061. And that's it for this month. Do keep trying if you've had difficulties getting through. Remember the numbers are on CFAX on page 186 if you have that. Or you can write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. We'll be back to give you an update at about a quarter past 11. In fact, I can tell you already that one of the calls we've had has given a new sighting of two young men running away from that park in Brighton where the two girls were found dead. We'll have more details in Crime Watch update. And uh, if that's beyond your bedtime, well, don't have nightmares. Do please sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>